Hello everyone, welcome back to a new episode of Advent of Code. Uh, this time, no preliminaries really to speak of. Uh, let's just get started on day three. No matter how you slice it. The elves managed to locate the chimney squeeze prototype fabric for Santa's suit, thanks to someone who helpfully wrote its box IDs on the wall of the warehouse in the middle of the night. Unfortunately, anomalies are still affecting them. Nobody can even agree on how to cut the fabric. The whole piece of fabric they're working on is a very large square, at least a thousand inches on each side. That is quite large. Uh, each elf has made a claim about which area of fabric would be ideal for Santa's suit. All claims have an ID and consist of a single rectangle with edges parallel to the edges of the fabric. Okay. Each claim's rectangle is defined as follows. The number of inches between the left edge of the fabric and the left edge of the rectangle, and then similarly for the top, and then the width and the height. Okay, so this is a claim ID number 123, suggests cutting at 32 with a width of 5 and a height of 4. Okay. The problem is that many of the claims overlap, causing two or more claims to cover part of the same area. For example, considering the consider the following claims. Yes, so great, we've drawn this. Mm hmm If the elves all proceed, how many square inches of fabric are within two or more claims? Ah, okay. I thought they were gonna ask us to identify like the one that it doesn't overlap with any, which I guess is not the hardest in the world, but this is a little easier to track because <clears throat> you can just mark spots on the on the grid with like what uh, you can just increment like the number of claims on the grid and not have to track where those claims came from. Okay, well this seems simple enough. Um, let's get started oh that's right i guess i did define the aoc alias now so now i have to like hit put a tab here oh well <clears throat> uh the aoc alias just reconnects me to this tmux session uh from when i'm outside of it so it doesn't really matter so give me day three please cool and let's just cat our input make sure it came out okay no 404 not found Oh, it's, I'm not supposed to say three. I'm just supposed to say O3, right? Yeah, okay. <clears throat> now, I imagine that the rest of this stuff will actually matter, right? We will need to know, um, oops, oh, mm, there we go. That's how you scroll. We will need to be able to track what came from where. Um, I mean, what, what is the area of all of these things? Like, they're all in the neighborhood of, like, 25 by 25, roughly, uh, which is a quarter of 100 squared, so a 16th of 10,000. So that's, like, a, I don't know, uh, 1,500 or something like that. <clears throat> So we have to do like 1500 times 1500 operations if we just do this in the most obvious way of like for each, iterate over all the claims and for each claim, iterate over all the squares in the claim and increment an item in a map. Um, and that, that, that seems like not necessarily the most optimal plan, although I can't immediately think of anything better. Uh, but furthermore, it seems within the realm of computability, right? It's not something that's going to be so large we'll never finish the program if we do it that way. Um, it's useful to, to do these kinds of back-of-the-envelope calculations before you get started to see if your approach is going to be at all reasonable. Um, here it should be just fine. Um, now how about parsing this input format? We could get fancy and use parsec, and I think that would be fine. Um, but it won't be necessary. This is a simple enough format that it would be probably easier to just write our own little tiny parser than um, to get out parsec. And I mean, of course, actually, this input format is extremely amenable to a regular expression. Like, I'm sure everyone in the universe will use regular expressions uh, 
and they're often used in situations in which they are not actually all that suitable. Um, but, you know, because that's just like the parsing tool that people know about, even though they're not like technically a parser, they're more of like a lexer. But here, what we need is so simple that regular expressions are actually great. Um, on the other hand, I don't actually like know what the state of the art is for um, regular expressions in Haskell. I guess we can check real quick. Haskell regular expression. I spelled it wrong, but who cares? Um, regular expressions. Some weirdo has implemented, uh, I mean, I don't know. I don't care about the guy's name. Um, regex dash PCRE, I guess, is the one that I would want. I like PCRE. I'm very familiar with it. Um, number of alternate, yeah. So, regex PCRE. I mean, I don't, this doesn't actually tell me very much. Text.regex, do I want that? Regex compat. There's all these instances for what you can make regexes out of. Make regex takes a string. Match is a list of sub-expression matches. All right. Um, I think that I would like to get at least a little bit comfortable with using regexes in Haskell, and I'll try this out. And if it uh, turns out to be too complicated, we can always go back to just doing things by hand, which should be pretty simple. Uh, yeah, so let's, let's just um, see if I can just add this to... Like, uh, does this just work? Stack build. Okay, it's found regex and knows that it works and needs to compile it. Fine, so we can we can deal with that when it's when it's ready. In the meantime, we'll just assume that we have it available. Um, the functions that we care about are all in import text.regex, and the ones that we want are make regex and match regex, right? And I think that should really be all that we need because it returns a list, maybe a list of strings. Yeah, that's a very simple package. I appreciate this. Um, how's that going? It's finished. Okay, uh, so let's turn on intero mode here. And of course it has to like get all ready and stuff, but fine, we're good now. So let's see, what is parse? Well, we'll want a function, actually. So here's where we get to a thing we haven't done yet in Haskell is defining new data types. Haskell is all about types. Well, I mean, one of Haskell's prominent features of the many prominent features in which Haskell, uh, of which Haskell, which are contained by Haskell, anyway. Uh, is types. And so in many languages, you might use, say, you might just use enclosure. You would use a, a, a map with some well-defined fields in like C, C++ or Java. You'd use a class in like C. You'd just use a struct. Um, Haskell has more powerful, well, differently powerful um, data types. Um, so what, we define a type by saying data, and then we give it a name. So what do they call this? They call this a claim, so we'll call it a claim also. Data claim equals, and we have to define a constructor, at least one. Well, I guess technically you can have zero, but that's not useful, um, except for the one. There's only one data type with no constructors, and it doesn't really matter. Um, so we'll just say, we'll just, we'll name the constructor claim as well. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what this syntax means for now. And then we just define a list of the type. Um, well, we'll make it a record. Why not? Um, no, because it's bad. <laughs> uh, gosh. 
I always like there's a lot of different ways you can model types and I'm and varying from heavyweight to lightweight and I never know quite what the best way to do it is. Um, and, and, and you can choose them based on like how much help you want the compiler to give you in making sure that you use things correctly. I think we'll just do something pretty basic and just define a record that has four fields. Um, the absolute most basic thing we could do would be this and say, oh, I forgot to resolve the autocomplete issue. It still shows up in black. Oh, well. Um, what are you upset about up here? Oh, I just haven't saved or yeah, okay. We can say claim is the name of a data type. It has one constructor also named claim, although we could have chosen a different name. And that constructor takes four arguments, each of type int. And then we use that constructor to build types, uh, values of type claim, and we can pattern match on this constructor to extract the integers from the type, from, from the value of the type claim. Uh, you can already see some problems with this, which is that like, it's not labeled, right? How do I, I have to like, just sort of know that um, the first field is X, the second field is Y, the third field is width and the fourth field is height or something. So this is not a very good representation of a type. You might even ask, why does Haskell allow you to define types this, this sloppily? And the answer is there are a lot of types that are actually really useful to define in this way. Um, for example, if all the value, if all the fields were of different types, it would be reasonably clear, you know, what means what. Um, but also you can do kind of really fancy things. And I'll show you something cool, which is, Actually, this is the definition of Boolean in Haskell's standard library. That's it. There's nothing, it's not part of the language as a built-in, it's just something you could write yourself if you wanted. And people often define things that are isomorphic to Booleans, but that have sort of a different interpretation. I think you treat them differently. So this is an example of having multiple constructors. So we can say a bool is either a constructor, there, it has two constructors. You can construct one with true, and that constructor takes no arguments. Or you can construct one with false, and that constructor takes no arguments. And then you can pattern match on true and false, and using that you can build functions like and and or and so on. And that's really all bool needs. I mean, actually, it has more. It has some, you know, it's part of some some type classes or so on. But this is the, the definition of the structure of the type. And likewise, we've looked at maybe before. Um, but you can get out of here, autocomplete. Maybe is also not a built-in. It's just a thing defined in the standard library using this very powerful and expressive, uh, not syntax exactly, but this, this the way it has, it's called abstract data types is what Haskell calls it. And so we can say maybe is not exactly a type. It's a type constructor, we call it, uh, at taking one argument, one type level argument, A. So maybe isn't a type, but maybe int is a type. Maybe string is a type. So for any type A you want, you can make a maybe type out of it by calling this maybe type constructor. And a value of type maybe A is either nothing or just containing an A. And so you can see here that like giving these fields names is not really necessary to understand a value of type maybe. It's sort of quite clear. Um, so that's why we're allowed to define types like this, but that doesn't mean that we should. This is a crummy type. Uh, there's a few things we could do. Um, one is if we like, if we could do something pretty simple, and I what I think is actually a good good answer here, we could say x y width height all of type int. Seems pretty like now we've named all the fields, we've said they're all of type int, and we get uh, for free along with this we get accessor functions. Now like if we um, if we ask hey. Uh, well, actually, I don't even have to open up a REPL, right? Height is a function defined as taking a claim and returning an int. It takes a claim as input, looks up the height field, and returns that. So we get that for free by, by naming the fields of the constructor. Cool. Um, but there's another way we could have chosen to define this, which would be asking the compiler for a lot more cooperation. We could define many different types. Um, we could say new type... Um, new type is basically, well, 
you can see right here the kind of three basic ways Haskell gives you to define new types. You can use type, which just gives a new name to an existing type and changes nothing about it. They're still used interchangeably. Right? We call part one and we pass it a list of string, but we think of it as, a, uh, as a, an input. They're the same type. The compiler lets you convert between them freely. Um, the sort of next most lightweight way to define types is a new type. We could say new type. Um, uh, we could say a uh, new type y coordinate equals int. Uh, y int. So it's a, the constructor is named y, and the value inside it is an int. And it's a lot like a data declaration, as we see on the line below, um, with the primary restriction that you can only have a single field and a single constructor, um, in exchange for which you get the guarantee that it is free to convert between those two types. But the compiler won't do it explicit, implicitly. You have to do it manually and say, I am taking the y-coordinate. I would like the int out of it, please. Um, and so this allows you to guarantee you don't ever accidentally interpret an x-coordinate as a y-coordinate. Um, and so we could do um, maybe a, uh, you know, so we could do something like this with an x-coordinate as well. And then we could say, OK, well, we could define, say, a uh, new type uh, length a equals l of a. And then we could say data claim prime. I'll, you know, this is just a, an alternate definition we could have used for claim equals um, an x core. Uh, oops, not equals. An x chord, a y chord, and a length of x chord, and a length of y chord. In this way, we encode the types, how we plan to use the fields of claim, into the type of claim itself and ask the compiler uh, to help us uh, in, in interpreting, making sure that we don't ever misuse them, making us claim explicitly. I plan to use this as x. And so I think that while this is probably the more pragmatic approach, I'd like to play around with my claim prime here, at least for a while, um, and see. Because I've, I've done things like define type aliases or define kind of weird, like, flimsy types like this. And I get them confused sometimes when there's two ints used, like, uh, for different purposes. And, and actually, why x is often, like, a more... Uh, natural type to work with in computers. And so I could imagine myself getting confused about which is which. Anyway, I, I do think this is probably the best type, but this is one that'll let us show off uh, some ways in which Haskell can protect you. Um, so uh, what we're looking for is we want a function that, um, well, first of all, we're gonna change this to map parse. And our input is going to be a list of Well, actually, that's silly, isn't it? We just have parse be. Well, yeah, fine. Um, I'm going to change our input to be a list of claim prime. <laughs> and uh, parse yeah, is a function that takes a single string and returns one input which is a, a claim. Wait. Well, I guess our input then, this is, ugh. <laughs> I guess I should just leave the types alone and say um, map um, read claim composed with lines, let's say. And uh, so it's actually inferred. It won't tell me because it's upset about this out of scope type, but it's inferred that the type of, that read claim must have is string to claim prime, which is kind of cool, isn't it? Um, so let's read claim string to claim prime, read claim equals undefined. And like, so this all read clam. 
this all compiles, but like doesn't do anything yet. Uh, but with make regex and match regex, we should be okay. So, so uh, let's see. Let's. Let um, r equal make regex of. So let's let's go. Um, no, hang on. Let's go look at our input file here. And so what's our regex here? It's a hash sign, and some number of integers, a space, an at, some some other number of integers, a comma, colon, some more integers, an x. I missed the backslash in that other one. I'm used to closure where like you can actually, you don't need to double escape things just to put them in a string literal. Um, <clears throat> In well, actually, I don't need to do this let, do I? I can just say it's equal to go where uh, r equals this and go equals undefined. So my idea is to not create the regex every time we call read claim, but rather create the regex once and save that in the lex lexical closure for read claim so that it is always available and we don't have to recompile it every time. There's probably some caching going on so that this is unnecessary, but whatever. Um, and then we'll say go of s to be case match regex of, what is the type of match regex? For all tt, that's clearly incorrect. What? I just wanted to know what argument, what order the arguments come in. It takes a regex and then a string. I, I don't know why we have this ridiculous. Oh no, get out of here! I didn't mean to open a, rep, a shell inside of Emacs. I meant to switch to my existing shell outside of Emacs. So why do we get this ridiculous type from Intero mode? I don't know. It's weird. But it takes a regex and then a string. So we want to case match regex rs of nothing to like, I mean, okay. This is sort of cheating, but like, no match. So you can sort of have to decide when you're work doing exercises like Advent of Code how careful you want to be about handling error cases you know won't be present in your input. Really, the best thing to do would be to have read claim uh, return a maybe claim prime, and then um, oh, I forgot. A claim should also have um, an int, I guess, which is, well, we'll just new, new type in, uh, ID equals ID of int. Because we'll probably care about the claim IDs eventually. Um, I just happened to notice there were five things here. We only had four fields in our, uh, in our data, data type. So really, read claim should return maybe a claim. And then we should handle the case that one of the inputs is nothing. Uh, and actually, you know what? Like, uh, that's a great way to demonstrate like the power of um, of uh, 
Haskell's type system, allowing us to handle like there might be a nothing here, and like it's sort of we can we can rather than like throwing an exception or whatever, we can actually write a function that deals with the fact that there's nothings in here, and we can do it in a very small amount of code. So this is actually going to be like a more complicated program than it really has to be because we're handling a lot of errors we didn't need to. We're being more explicit about types than we need to to kind of show off the kinds of things you can do with Haskell. Um, maybe maybe I shouldn't do this because it may make Haskell look too imposing to someone a bit new to it. Um, but I don't know. That's that's the kind of programming that I want to practice. You know, writing tiny little tiny little scripts that assume their input is correct. Like, fine, I've done that. I know how to do it. I'd rather like show off some cooler stuff you can do with um, with the fancier types that you have. So instead of doing a case match, let's in fact um, just we'll change this to be a maybe, and now we'll say so match regex r of s. Um, I guess I actually want to map f map over it. Um, fmap extract will say, well, what am I doing? This is a silly way to write this. So we'll write a function called extract that takes a list of these things, an extract of id x, y, the width, height, equals claim prime of id id uh, x coordinate x y coordinate y why are you lighting up all my types i guess i'm just because i'm not done yet um and we called this a length yeah length So we want a length of x coord, which means we need length x width and a length y height. OK, all of this fails to compile. Why? Ah. We were getting a list of. Oh, these, we call these x, not x coord, and y. There we go. Now y is length of set. It wants, we call that l. OK, cool. Uh, so this shouldn't be map. It should be traverse. And uh, What are you upset about? Why is it? I wish it wouldn't. Like, I, I moved the. Because I wanted to look at a different part, and it, like, moved the screen back. Um, well, OK, so let's, let's test what we have now. Um, did it actually parse it? Yeah, it did. So let's, write, let's try read claim of. And this actually will say, hey, I, I don't know how to display values of your type. Yeah, it doesn't have show. Uh, but we, we might as well define that. Um, nothing. Failed to parse. OK, well, that's exciting. We know we made a mistake. Um, Y. Hash and then some digits, space at, some digits, comma, some digits, colon, space, 
digits x digits. So this seems like it ought to have worked. I wonder if I don't understand what like some part of the syntax of Haskell's of, of the regex library that I chose. Okay, let's try oops, meant to be on this line. Match regex of make regex of Oh, I bet actually it's got more uh, return values than I expected um, on uh, one, two, three. Nothing? What? Well, that, I mean, that clearly matches. Well, the first one does anyway. Okay, so that returns a just and just the capturing groups. So, okay, maybe I don't understand what make regex means. Multi line. Oh, God, it's fucking egrep. All right. How do I make it be something more reasonable? I took the PCRE version, didn't I? Thought I did. Maybe I didn't. Okay. Well, that blows. I mean, I, I guess I can just like, if I do this, it still doesn't match. Right, we tried that. I don't know how the fuck egrep works. Give me a real. I just want Perl. Regex PCRE. It wraps. Okay. So what's in Regex PCRE though? Sorry, you guys can't see this. Um, Where do I find Wait, what is this link about apple and orange? The correct Okay, I, I don't care about this theoretical stuff. I just want to know the uh So regex PCRE, I showed you guys this because like I told you in a previous episode, browsers are a very personal thing. Uh, I don't mind showing you guys like pages I'm looking at, but you never know what might be in the autocompletes or, or God knows what. Um, okay, so here's text regex PCRE. This is what I actually wanted, I guess. And like, does it, if you import, okay. So yeah, it just re-exposes whatever sub-module I choose. I'll choose this one. Uh-huh, so fine. Compile takes like a string and hopefully gives you a regex. Oh my goodness. All right, this actually just like delegates to PCRE and so it has like IO to compile the regex and IO to call it which I'm not very excited about. Okay. Well, I don't like that so much either. PCRE light. No, this is more FFI. What's regex compat? Okay, that's an old one, regex base. Okay, these define types that the other backends use. Regex parsec, yeah. Okay, well, 
regex posix. Okay, I don't want to deal with like having to do IO to call C libraries to do matching. So we're just going to write our own parser, which would have, if we had start started with that, it would have been simpler and shorter um, than doing all of this. Uh, but uh, let's see. God, this stinks. Um, it's not actually that much fun to write a raw string parser for this. I don't understand like how how Haskell PC Haskell Larry expression like can I get one without I/O? I don't know. I can read papers about regexes in Haskell if I want. Here's a post someone wrote. I just spent a few hours trying to figure out how to use basic regular expressions in Haskell. Which one should I use? Use PCRE and wait, this one doesn't seem to have IO like it looked like it would. Right? Where were these functions when I was reading the docs? I can maybe high level interface there's a regex ah wait this is a completely this is completely different than what i was reading earlier when i thought i was looking at the same package wasn't i this one doesn't have a bunch of io over it so this takes Jeez. Source must be a regex maker of regex. <laughs> okay. And this, it just takes a source one? Regex context? I need to read this guy's blog post. Jeez. All text matches. So what about capturing groups? It doesn't say anything about capturing groups. So, all right. Our target has to be a regex context. What is a regex context? Yes, polymorphic interface to do matching. Sure, of course. But what are the instances of regex context? Huh. There are a lot of them. What a mess. The options for how to carry if match regex are kept as part of the regex. Regex options, regex maker, extract. Get all text matches. Uh huh. But I want, okay, a list, a list of lists. It has, it points that out. That's kind of what I want, right? I want a list of string, sort of. I don't know, not really. Match array. What's a match array? Oh gosh, the indexes in the string at which it matched? Are you kidding me? Match text is an array of indexed by int of tuples of the source type, the offset, and the length. 
Oh, no wonder I never learned how to use reg X's in Haskell, huh? Jesus Christ. Um, honestly, like, Parsec is so much easier. Let's just do Parsec, right? Like, okay. I know how to use Parsec. Um, so Parsec is Haskell's parser library. Um, I'll just say I want Parsec and like I should get it, right? Yeah, dependencies changed. It's getting, yeah, my stuff didn't compile because I removed the dependency, but fine, it found Parsec for me, great. Um, Text.parsec, is that legal? Does that exist? No, jeez. Haskell parsec. Here's a package. Um, Text.parsec string. Not exactly. I just want like text parsec char. Sure. Why are you saying this doesn't exist though? I thought we just got that from our dependencies. Yeah, I mean, I know these like don't have the correct types. I was in, although I don't actually know why. I should be able to, Okay, let's suppose I were to delete my entire source file <laughs> and main equals pure nothing. Will you then compile for me and get me parsec? It will. Ah. I think Intero doesn't have it because I changed my dependencies since I started up Intero. Is that correct? No. Okay, did I get the wrong? No, it's named Parsec. And it's in my dependencies. Stack. I don't even know what you can type into stack. What, what might I want to do? I don't know, I just wanna like build because it should get all my stuff, right? Stack, stack list depend, dependencies. Deprecated, you put it right there, but okay. We have parsec, it's right there. Stack build. And like this actually compiles, but in Taro, it doesn't compile. Okay, let's just close this file. And then we will reopen it and it will magically work. Terra mode enabled. Okay. I mean, this actually seems to be working out better, right? I don't know why. So can I import like, uh, sorry, one of or something? Yeah. Well, no, it has, it has type for all TT. What is wrong with you? But it compiles, right? Like type one of, it's right there. But Intero doesn't know about it, but the Intero REPL knows about it. Why? Maybe it's in the context where it doesn't understand it. Um, no, I don't know. I'm just like not super impressed with Intero these days. Um, but okay, 
fine. Um, let's just grab the things we will probably need. Uh, so we want like spaces. Um, we want, oh, sorry. Uh, we want digit and we probably want like char or something to parse a specific character. Yeah. I'm copying these into the, into the, in the text buffer. Don't worry about it. You guys can keep looking at this. Um, and that's about all we, that should be all the functions we need from text parsec char. Um, and from text parsec string, yeah, we'll import a parser for that. Um, import text parsec string, we will import, I know you guys can't see it, don't worry, we'll get you back there, parser, and parse from file. which actually takes a string, not a file. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Where, oh, I, yeah, okay, this is my run parser. But it returns IO? Why? Can't it return, like, just either a parse error or a T? Oh, using read file, I see. So it actually reads from a file itself. So that's not quite what I want. Uh, text parsec. Token, token, run parser, parse. Takes a parser, a name of a source, a source, and produces either a parse error or an input. So that's what we want. Um, import text parsec. So these are the imports we'll be using to use Parsec. God, this, this file is a mess. Ugh. Parse text, yeah, no, 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 no. Okay, I think, I think we have everything we need here. Um, the nice thing about Haskell's, oh my God, I just looked at my recording software and I thought my mic was muted, but it's not. Okay, that would've been a really sad way to waste 45 minutes. Uh, so, Do I have to reload Intero again? Do you know about this? You know about parse, okay. Um, Parsec is a very composable uh, parser. Unlike a regex, which is just like one giant blob of thing that you write once and then never know how it works again. Um, Haskell's parsing libraries are really great. T best in class, better than any language I've ever seen. Really easy to write parsers and easy to maintain them as well. Uh, they're not necessarily the fastest because you can write such powerful parsers in such quick ways, um, but they handle inputs that would be hard to do in any other way. Um, so let's write uh, claim is going to be a parser of claim prime. Easy. And in fact, let's start by defining a parser for ints. Int is a parser of int. Int is just read many digit, easy. Um, and so claim is going to be what claim equals do. Um, let's start there. We, let's see, I have my regex down here to refer to how things are gonna do, but uh, we'll just say char this, which will get discarded. Um, ID int spaces char hat spaces. So this is all and uh, x int char comma. You can see we're basically just like writing down the format of the text file and say, stating whether to like throw away the thing you just parsed or to save it somewhere with this arrow. Uh, y is an int. Uh, oops. Char colon spaces. Uh, width is an int. 
char x height is an int. And then we uh, return claim prime of this. There you go. It type checks, it's great. So let's now try this. Why, oh, did I not import many? I didn't. I don't actually want many things. I think I want many one, meaning I need at least one. Parsec chart is not an export many one. Oh, it's probably in something else, right? Uh, it's in like, yeah, it's actually in base because it's not based on characters. It's based, it works for a parser of anything. Um, yeah, Haskell's parser library is flexible enough that it doesn't have to work on strings. It can work on tokens of any type. Um, so you can run a lexer over it first. But it's also powerful enough to be its own lexer. And so people often just use it on, on uh, string inputs. So we, we did something here recently uh, where we tried to parse a thing. And so let's say I instead wrote, uh, what did I call this, by the way? Did I call it parse? No, I call it claim. Um, parse, using the parser claim on an input file called standard in this string. And like, would you look at that? It just fucking returns the right thing right away. It's so much easier than regexes. I don't know why anyone uses anything but parsec. <laughs> okay, pardon me. Uh, so it returns like the type that we wanted and it's like kind of super easy to see what it does. Um, it's more flexible than the regex because like, well, I don't know about that. But like, remember we had to kind of write, okay, map read over the input, which worked because every single input happened to be an int. But what if we needed to read some like floats in here or something? We would have matched the string called you know, read float on one thing and read int on another thing. Um, and maybe something else needed to be a more complex data type and we'd have to call a separate parser on it. In Parsec, we were able to define once, here's how to parse an int from a part of a string to something that returns not a part of a string, but an int. Um, and so when we call int here, it actually saves an integer into the ID field while we're still in the middle of parsing. Um, and then when we're done, we just return this, um, pure is, is some necessary nonsense to get it, to get your, your, the claim type lifted into the parser type, but it doesn't super matter. Um, we actually could be somewhat more, uh, fancy, I guess. We have sort of this repeated pattern here where we say, read an int, read a single character, read an int. Um, and so what we could do is say um, pair is a function from char to parser of two ints. And pair is equal, pair of c equals, um, and we could do this with a do as well, and I'll show you what that looks like. Um, x int char c y int pure x, y, right? Fine, we can do that. But actually, uh, how would you do this with an applicative? <laughs> yeah, you, you can make this a bit a bit fancier, uh, much, much shorter, but having the same. So let's say pair prime is the same thing, is um, take this function for building a tuple and embed it in a parser in the following way. Embed it into the parser of int um, char c int. Is that correct? Yeah. And if we look at the type of pair, it says it's a function from character to a whole bunch of mess, but this is basically the same thing as parser int int. Um, and you can you can be kind of 
condensed with reg with uh, parsec this way if you want. Um, sort of a style thing. I think this is kind of nice for something as simple as this. We don't need to rat sp spread it over five lines. So I'll just do this. And having defined pair, we can now say uh, here, um, actually, each of our things starts with a space as well. And so we can, um, We could say ignore some spaces first, right? Why is this not? Uh... Ah. Operator precedence. I guess it was parsing. OK, it doesn't matter. So now we can just take this, this whole thing and say x, y is a pair separated by a comma. And then likewise, w h is a pair separated by an x. So you can build um, sort of little mini libraries for parsing your domain type using parsec so that you don't have to do everything at like the level of regular expressions with no way to build abstraction on top of that. The language of building parsers with parsec is functions, and Haskell is great at building functions. So as most programming languages should be great at building functions. So you can do this. Cool. So I like this parser. It's a good parser for claim. Um, and so now we're back to wanting this read claim function. Um, and we don't need this whole regex nonsense. What we're just going to do is say s equals parse. Actually, we don't even need this, do we? Well, yeah, we do. Let's say case parse. Um, well, actually, we can we can just return either parse error or a claim. Uh, parse claim standard in, and we need to import parse error, which is probably here. Yeah. And like this actually type checks. That's amazing. Right? It's a, a function from string to either a parse error or a claim. And and uh, what? Now I need to figure out why why this whole fmap thing didn't work out right. Um, claim derives show, that's fine. So when we call parse, ah, we needed lines. What is our parse function? It doesn't exist. I just deleted it. Uh, traverse read claim. How's this? Part one is not defined, sure. Oh my god, the types all work. Okay, so traverse is a really cool function. It has a type which is not very easy to understand if you don't know what you're looking at. Um, wait, now it doesn't? No, it does. Okay. Um, there are many ways you can instantiate the types in traverse. Um, if we look at, if we just look at the, tra the type here, it's not very clear. What's traversable? What's applicative? Um, but let's look at a couple. Well, it's easier to start with sequence A, and then notice that traverse is kind of like a fancier version of sequence A. The so sequence A looks sort of similar, but basically there are lots of types that are traversable and types that are applicative, and sequence A works for all of them. In particular, uh, lists are traverse. I always forget which which one is which. Yeah, lists are traversable and maybe is applicative. Actually, both are both. But um, so what we can do is we can say like just one, just two. Here's a list of two maybe ints. Fine. What if I were to sequence A it? I get 
maybe a list of ints. We kind of flip the order there. Instead of a list of maybes, we have maybe a list. Well, that's interesting. What if we were to put a nothing in here and then like say just three? It says, nope, there was a nothing in that list. So your list has no result. Um, either is also a, an applicative type. And it, its effect is like um, to stop if it gets to any lefts and it's otherwise build up all the rights that it got. So we could look at um, left fail, well, right one, right two, like this will do the same thing, right one, two. But if we instead say left fail, right three, we get back left of fail. So it's a way to take in the case of maybe and either, a way to take something that could fail inside of a container of some kind and lift the failure to be around the container, making the whole container fail at once. Um, it, it has other effects in like other kinds of applicatives, but that's how it works for these applicatives. Um, and traverse is a similar thing, except that before you do that, you also map over the result. Um, so, you take a func you know, like some A's and a function that turns an A into a maybe of B, and then it maps that over the list and then calls sequence A on the result. Um, so I'm not going to show you guys an example of that. I hope you can like sort of understand it. Maybe not like perfectly. Maybe take some time to think about it. But that's why we're traversing read claim. We want to map read claim over the list of lines and then sequence A the result so that we get back either a single parse error or a list of all of the successfully parsed inputs. And we no, don't have to worry about failure anymore after that. Um, and then instead of just calling part one and part two on the input, I'm going to fmap uh, part one and part two over it, which means if it was a left, leave it alone. That is say, if there was a parse error, just return that parse error. If it was a right, that is a list of successfully parsed things, then call part one and part two on that list of successfully parsed things. So Haskell's error handling is like really powerful and also you can make it feel almost implicit, um, but it doesn't require help from the runtime, right? Either fmap, traverse, these are all functions that someone just wrote in Haskell. It doesn't have to be something special like exceptions in Java, which you couldn't implement in Java yourself. Okay, we've finally done an hour into the video and we've parsed the input, probably. Um, So let's just quickly verify that this is correct by running stack build. Well, and then uh, stack, can I just say run GAC on app main feeded input? Yeah. So it produces a giant pile of garbage. Um, but that pile of garbage starts with a write, meaning you successfully parsed all of the inputs, and here is a list of them. Um, you know, we have one list that ends here and starts uh, on the right of the screen, like so. We have another list, another claim here to here, and so on. Hello? How do I get out of? Page mode? OK. So now we can start like actually solving the problem. And we wasted a bunch of time because I was trying to figure out regexes. If I had just, and also because I did some explaining to you guys, if I had just implemented this like from scratch, it would have been pretty simple. Like this is fairly rote. I know how to do this pretty well. Um, also, we wasted a bunch of, not wasted, we spent a bunch of time on discussing ways to define types and why this way is a reasonably good way. Um, so all that done, let's get into actually solving the problem. Claims equals something. Um, what is it that we're supposed to return, by the way? I guess I'll leave the parsec docs open. Uh, we're supposed to return how many square inches of fabric are within two or more claims? OK, so it will return an int after all. Um, and I guess we're going to want a map, right? Um, for 
that. Let's go put containers. These are like the two libraries that I use for everything. I don't know any other Haskell libraries. I have to look them up. Um, so if I intero restart, am I going to get something that knows about data map again? Like if I say, like what is the type of M empty please? It has no idea. Oh, I guess my, my file does indeed fail to compile, doesn't it? Undefined. Yes, it's a map. Okay. And it's not pointing out errors here. So if I were to say like m.empty, like it knows what type this has here too. Okay, so it's not the same problem we had before where like only the REPL knew about it for some reason. Great. So we have a map. Um, and so what I want is let's define a type here. Um, type sheet, let's say, is a map from pairs of ints. Actually, we have x chords and y chords, right? To int, number of times it has been used, right? Um, but it won't compile because this doesn't derive or. Uh, we'll probably want eek on this as well, I guess. Might want ord, who knows? Okay, so this all compiles. This was a legal type definition for a map. So what we're gonna do is iterate over all of the claims. And for each claim, insert into the map at each of the points on the claim, a one, incrementing if we see uh, anything else there already. And how many are within two or more? Okay. Um, so part one of claims is going to be um, I probably shouldn't try to do this as a big old foldar, should I? Let's see. I guess it would be a good idea to use a list monad here, right? Use lists as a monad. A list comprehension over the claims and then within the claim over its x and within the x, uh, well, over, let's say, its height, actually. Uh, and then insert all of those into the map. So, um, Haskell data map. Um, See, we can, we build a map. Where's data map strict? Okay. And I guess we want data map strict actually, because I don't require laziness and I don't want to blow up my map. From, well, Conversion, that's the opposite, right? Yeah. Building from lists, a pair of key values. Yeah, this is, we still wanna do what we did last time, which is to use um, insert with, I guess. Okay. Um, so, I'm going to say let uh, inputs be do. So I'm going to iterate over some things, producing a list of in coordinates to make. Um, 
God, this is such a messy program. I already kind of regret defining these like very careful new types here that are just going to be a pain to work with. But they're going to guarantee I don't mess it up, by golly. Um, so what we'll do is uh, claim from claims. So we're going to, for each claim, name it claim. And then um, for each dx uh, starting from, ugh, I guess I, sh I actually should destructure the claim here, right? Claim prime of, I don't care about the ID, x, x, y, y, l, x, width, L, Y, height. Actually, I think I don't need those there. Yeah. Um, so DX from one, no. How, so four by four. So if it has a width of four, I want from z zero up to one minus uh, the width, I guess. Or width minus one. Actually, why am I, um, why don't I just start at X and go up to X plus width minus one. Um, we'll call it CX and CY for claim X and claim Y. Y up to Y plus height minus one. Um, and then we will return CX. Mm, X, CX, Y, CY. Right? So we're iterating over the claim, and then for its x and y components, we're iterating over each of those and producing a list of coordinates, carefully labeling them as x and y in uh, fold l pro fold l strict, I guess. Um, it's not an int, you weirdo. But if, I guess, Intero's point is that, like, well, You've written, the way you've written this, it must be an int, uh, but you didn't define it. Like, gosh, I don't know. I wish you would just kind of know that I uh, um, do I have to import that from data.list or something? Uh, Yeah, it's out of scope, okay. Import data.list, fold L prime. Now it knows what type fold L has. Okay, great. Um, so I need a function here that takes a, um, well, let's just say fold L add where add equals f. What is the type that this should have, please? Why are you not? Fold L has, it wants a function, an initial value, and a list of things. Why is it not giving me a better definition of whole? Intero is just, no. F has type just T. But I haven't, why can't it infer what, the, what type T should be? See here, it tells me what type it should be. It's a function taking a map and a pair and returning a map. 
So we can just say lambda of x, x, y, y, and, oh wait, it wanted the map first, didn't it? Is this correct? I always forget. Fold L wants the map first. Okay, so I did get these correct. But okay, we can just say m dot insert with plus of. I just want like frequencies again, don't I? Yeah, I do. Um, but we implemented frequencies badly last time because we were using lazy and fold R and we should have been using a strict fold L prime. Oh, speaking of strict. I'm done insert with plus, and then the key. Oh, I don't have to name these. Uh, chord, and then a one and M. So what are you mad about now? Yes, correct. Okay, great. It's pointing out that I'm returning an int, but that I said I'm returning an int, but I actually returned a map. And that's a fair point. I was gonna do more stuff with this. I shouldn't have said let in um, freaks equal. And uh, then I need to look at the data map uh, documentation and see how do you look up its values, because that's what I want, right? Convert to a list, elems, okay. In um, length filter equal, no, greater than one elements of freaks m dot elements thank you okay we have no compiler errors it must be correct right there you go a big number that seems plausible so let's give that to advent of code it's the right answer. Okay, thank goodness. Amidst the chaos, oh look, they're asking me exactly what I guess they might ask. You notice that exactly one claim doesn't overlap by even a single square inch of fabric with any other claim. If you can somehow draw attention to it, maybe the elves will be able to make Santa's suit after all. So, fine. Uh, that should be relatively, well, I don't know about straightforward, but... Um, Day one, part, day three, part one. Okay, now we have to look a little bit more carefully at how we structured things. Um, what could we have, like what really would have been a better way would be to have the map contain instead a list at each entry, which is how, wh what claims point at it, right? Um, although it's actually not clear how we would use, even if we had written it that way. Uh, Uh, okay, I guess what we can do is build this map the way that we did, but lift it out of part one and put it into like part of the generic parsing stuff, not parsing, but input handling. 
and then feed the list to part one, which will just be a very simple look for which ones are greater than one. Now I know, of course, I could throw away part one here, but I like to have my repository represent a solution to both parts one and two when I'm done. Um, anyway, so pass, pass this big old map into part one and also into part two, um, as well as the claims, the list of claims, because part two is... We kind of want to iterate over each claim and then for the claim, see if we can find any entries in the map from the positions within that claim that are claimed more than once. If we get to any, we stop. And if we don't, then uh, we say, congratulations, we found the answer. So really, we should define a helper function that does some of the stuff in part one, which uh, a couple, in fact. We should say um, locations takes a claim and returns a list of pair of x chord and y chord, right? And now locations equal, uh, uh, locations of claims equals do this, right? Um, and we can just say let inputs equal locations claims. Why are you upset? Couldn't match expected type claim list of claim prime with actual type. Oh, of course. This is um, this is for a single claim, right? And so really, we should say this. And that now locations claims is wrong because we want to actually um, Uh, this this is the bind operator, and when applied to lists, it takes basically a list of things and a function to call on a thing, and returns a list of the results. Uh, but it doesn't just map; it like maps and flattens a level. So we're basically saying each claim is going to give you a list of locations, and I don't want them split up by claim when I get them back. I just want all the locations. Uh huh. And actually, we're going to lift this stuff into another helper, but this was the, a good first step. Um, now we'll take this stuff and say um, we're basically going to make this a function as well because we want to pass that into both uh, thingies, both part one and part two. Well, do we though? It feels a bit silly to have the input type be a list of claims and a map of where the claims went and just ignore the list of claims in part one, uh, but I guess that's fine. Um, I'll just I'll just pass the list of claims and they can each do the frequencying, but we still should define frequencies as a fun function here. Frequencies is a function from list of claim to sheet. No, this is not what it is. It is a function from well, sure. Frequencies equals 
like this, right? In. Good. Are we good? Oh, freak and seeds. Okay, so frequency has the right type, but it's implemented incorrectly. Um, oh, it doesn't have an. This is correct, but there should have been a way to do this. That doesn't matter. Um, we should, in principle, be able to like. Yeah, let's actually, oops. Just be this. And there should be a way to erase this argument and pass it implicitly, but it would end up looking worse, not better. So we're, we're calling claims bind locations, and then we're folding over it in the following way. Um, no, I keep forgetting which key binds go where. Okay, so if we do this again, we still get the same answer. So that's fine. Um, and part one is still correct. Now we can write part two of claims to be let freaks be frequencies of claims in the, and then do some more stuff, I suppose, right? We're returning a claim, but let's in fact return a list of int because there could in principle be zero or more than one of them. In do, um, and then we're gonna read back over the claims again. Claim prime of ID and x, x, wait. Yeah, I do need all of these. Ah, no, I just need to say like this, right? Say, read me a claim and get out its ID, but also save the claim in context as something called C. And then I will call locations on that. Um, for each location in locations of C, um, Guard, we'll have to import guard, but whatever. Guard that um, m dot. I know it's got exclamation points. What else do I want? Do I want this? What is the type of this? So type, it takes a map and returns maybe what was there. Um, just one. Uh, freaks, not M. And we have to import control.monad guard. What are you mad about now? Sure, I haven't returned a result yet. I wasn't. I wasn't finished yet. Uh, but fine. It knows what type guard is, and I'm returning the wrong type. And then, assuming that that worked, um, well, I don't want to return for every single one of these locations, do I? This is not quite correct. Um, guard all. Guard that, well, something freaks here, right? I want to put like a, and not even actually freaks. I want 
location C. And the hole here is of type coordinate coordinate to bool. Well, that's sort of easy, right? We can write equal one, equal just one, composed with uh, this. Tala question? Yes, okay. So guard that each of the locations in C, when looked up in the frequencies map, returns some value which, when you call equal just one on it, returns true. Uh, and then pure ID. Why? Ah, I had to say that I know it's an ID when I destructure it. Cool. So that seems OK. And when I run it, 235 is the only one with such a property. Well, that's nice. It's, it's nice that there was only one of them. Suggests I might have been right. That's the right answer. You are one gold star closer. All right, so this was definitely a slow week, for sure. Slow day, I should say. Um, we kind of wasted some time. Not wasted some time. We, As I said before, we, we spent some time. Um, going over ways to approach problems in Haskell and trying regular expressions, but giving up. And we saw some cool tools that like you guys, if you are new to Haskell, like didn't probably didn't understand fully, but saw some things that were neat, right? Like what was, what was some neat stuff that happened here? We wrote a parser by hand, like without needing regular expressions. And we wrote helper functions that were part of that parser. Um, instead of having to do everything at the very lowest level all the time. I mean, regexes are pretty high level, but it's nice to be able to build abstractions within your program instead of just using the one uh, abstraction that was given to you. Um, these, uh, eh, don't worry about it. <laughs> Applicative, you know, we'll, we'll just sort of treat those as magic for now. But observe that it basically, like, this says parse the thing on the left and throw it away, and then parse the thing on the right and return it. And likewise here. Parse the thing on the left and return it, and then parse the thing on the right but throw it away. And this says, okay, parse the thing on the left and the thing on the right, where this is implicitly parenthesized, like so. That's why we want to say both here, even though what's on the left looks like just a character we were throwing away. It's already been thrown away by this parser. And so this whole this parser as a whole, by the way, Intero, why aren't you telling me about the type of this? It is a parser of int. Yes, very good. Um, and then there's a bunch of other garbage in that type, but it, it is parser int is an, a type that is equivalent to that. It is an alias for this much longer type. Um, and so that's why we said with with this this thing here, parse the int on the left and parse the int on the right, uh, return both of them and call this tuple function on the result, kind of. It's not strictly true, but close. Um, and this this is the fmap operator. It says parse the thing on the right and then call read on the result. Now you've seen fmap used before on lists and on tuples and things, and it's like a really flexible operator that operates inside of anything that is a functor. And we haven't like talked super hard. Uh oh, I stopped Emacs. Uh, there we go, this is what I meant to do. Um, we haven't looked super hard at what a functor is, but maybes are functors, par uh, parsers are functors, lists are functors, ethers are functors, it's great. Um, so we could say, for example, um, let's take this function here, which adds one to a number. And first we'll just call it on five. But what if we had a list of numbers? Five, six. That doesn't work. Um, and so what you can do is uh, fmap it over the list of numbers, and you get basically just map. It returns the things. But you can use the same operator on, say, just a number, just five, and you get back just six. What if you call it on a maybe or on nothing? You just get back nothing. It's really cool, right? Um, 
only the parts of your program that need to care about the containers they're working with can care about them. And the rest can just sort of reach in and out as needed. Uh, what else did we do that was cool? I know this is a very long video, but uh, who cares? <laughs> There's, there's some cool stuff that happened. Uh, we saw how to use um, the same notation, this do notation, both for parsing things and for iterating through, doing nested loops through lists. Do is, you know, do works for any monad and lists and parsers are both monads, as are maybe, as are lists. That's amazing. So many things in Haskell are monads and you can use do to work with all of them in a uniform way. Uh, I guess I didn't even mention, this is the like, list from x to here, show me all the elements in between. So that was kind of cool. Um, what else? We kind of re-implemented frequencies in a kind of crummy way. Um, oh well. And part one was pretty simple once we did all of those things. Part two, eh, I mean, we basically just like wrote this one guard expression and that was it. And that was, everything else was based on the original stuff we had written. And it's nice that we, our, our claim type already had IDs in it, right? Um, so we didn't have to do anything weird to get those back. And we learned about traverse, how, how exciting. Um, mapping over a list and um, show me the type, traverse read claim, yeah. It's a function from list of string to either an error or a list of claim, which is great, right? You don't have to worry about handling the parse error at each step. So, cool. All right. Uh, yeah, I think I'm, I'm well finished with this. Um, with today's exercise. I hope you guys enjoyed and I hope you learned something. Thanks for watching and I'll see you next time.